Okay, then, if you have your Bible, we'd ask you to turn to the little epistle of Jude. Uh, just one chapter, so I don't know if it's correct to say Jude chapter 1 or just say Jude. Uh, the little book of Jude in the first verse. Jude, the first verse. The Bible says, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our Lord into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he had reserved in everlasting chains un under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your book, Lord. We thank you that you give it to us as an English-speaking people in a perfect, in a solid uh form that we may uh, rest our understanding of your word on. God, we pray tonight that you would meet with us. Lord, we pray for the people that uh, don't care enough to be in the Lord's house tonight. Uh, draw men unto yourselves, Lord, and we'd be faithful to give you the praise for it, for it's in Christ's name I do pray. Amen. Amen. Now, uh, some fairly familiar verses of Scripture, and every time I delve into Jude, I seem like I get a little bit more out of it than the time that I looked into it before. And we're really going to be focusing on these chains of darkness. And it's talking about a group of angels and a group of reprobate angels that were chained up. And we'll get to that in a minute because we find that they're not literally chained but they're chained to what's coming. Now, uh, we'll look at that a little bit closer in a minute. Now, of Jude himself, some suggest that he was the, the carnal brother of Christ, that he was a, a child of Joseph and Mary after the Lord Jesus was born of a virgin. Uh, I don't know enough about that to argue either way, but I do know this, that he knew the Lord Jesus intimately. He was a disciple. He possibly was an apostle. And as he's writing, uh, he, he really makes it understood how well that he knew Jesus. And so it begins, uh, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ. And think what a wonderful thing if when they said Larry, that's the first thing that people thought about. Now, unfortunately, I know that's not true uh, for myself, but it wouldn't be that that would be my desire is that's the first thought that someone would have of me uh, was that I was a servant of the Lord. Now, secondly, I want you to see a servant is a slave. Right. They have no option to what's being said. If it's said, they must do it. And if they don't do it, there's repercussions. Now, I'm not necessarily, and I'm not a slavery advocate, but it was for our learning that uh, slavery, there was no choice. And we are looked upon in Christ's eyes as servants, so there's no choice whatsoever concerning service. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, the brother of James. And again, that's kind of suggestive and James is actually mentioned as a brother of Christ. This is not James the Apostle. It is not him. It's the brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, many think Jude was a brother as well. And he does have one that's listed as Judas. 
that was given as uh, some of his brothers, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, and the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God. Now, the first one that this, this epistle uh, addresses, uh, he, he begins to give some qualifications for people who will understand it. Now, anytime you preach the Word of God, and after nearly 30 years, I see this more and more, it's not hitting home to some people, and you have to accept that. Not everybody's going to understand the Word of God, and even the Lord's redeemed is never going to understand all of it. And so I want you to see, as, as it's being written, he says, uh, <laughs> He addresses it to those that are sanctified or set apart by God. Now, the sanctified of the modern day is the elect. Really, that's been the sanctified throughout time is those that God elected to know by His goodness and grace. That is the sanctified. They're set apart for His glory. And then we have to understand and know there's another set set apart for His wrath. And, and the, the, those are two very realistic groups. And so he addresses the ones that belongs to the Lord God. I want you to see that the sanctification comes by the Father. In other words, he says, this one's mine. From eternity's past, the, set, the setting apart, the sanctified is done by God. And it, it is a done deal already. Then secondly said, and preserved in Jesus Christ. Now that preser preserving, just like the ladies preserved fruit in the summertime, that was done by the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. The preserved and the elect are the same group. The atonement is covered by the ones God said, these are mine, and that's it. it it's not a, a limited atonement, atonement in the sense of the power, but it is limited in its purpose, otherwise a portion of it's wasted. And we know that that's an impossibility to happen. So the second thing, he says, to God, meaning the Lord God Jehovah, and then he attributes the sacrifice to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then lastly, he says, and call. Uh, again and again, you think about even in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, uh, the called is repeated again and again and again. That drawing and wooing of the Holy Ghost is absolutely a necessity. Without that, uh, I certainly don't believe an individual is saved. And so we find that he is talking to a very specific group, the redeemed and the redeemed only. And to those people, mercy unto you. Now, we have to assume the flip side that the mercy is not extended to the others. Uh, he says, mercy and peace. You think about all the people you know and in the turmoil that we live in these days, who is peaceful about it? The only ones I know are the redeemed and not all of them. Uh, I mean, this, this world is up on the edge. Uh, just like me mentioning, no meat in the car school Walmart. You know what? Some people be, some people's going to be wrenching their hands over that, ain't they? They're going to be twisting and fidgeting and all upset. They lack peace. They lack understanding. But we see that those belong to the Lord's people. Those are part of the gifts to his elect. Uh, mercy and peace unto you, and love be multiplied. Now, I want you to see that you can't multiply something that's not there. Now, we all learned our times table. We've been getting Bella through those. And what is anything times zero? It's zero, right? So, Apparently, these individuals had something because they wanted it, the Lord God wanted it to be multiplied. And, and so you can evaluate yourself, any of those things that you have in the prior part of that verse, what God wants for you is more peace. What God wants for you is more, uh, more trust. What God wants for you, he wants multiplied 
for you to have more. Now, isn't it a wonderful thing tonight that our Lord God, in His wisdom and His kindness and His goodness, wants us to have more spiritual blessings than we possess today. And you know what? Uh, tomorrow, still, He'll want us to have more. That's His desire. Now, many of us don't live there, but that's what He wants. Beloved, when I gave all diligence or attention to detail to write unto you of the common salvation, and he wasn't called to calling the salvation of the Lord Jesus common, uh, Christ common or unclean, that he was wanting to rejoice in it. You know what? When we get together, we ought to be able to rejoice over our personal testimony of redemption. And that's what this man was wanting to do. But when he got down to the point of testifying and telling of the goodness of God, someone had slipped in and he had to remind them of some stuff. Now, that's the nature of the devil. He said he had to come back in and just uh, put the tenets of the faith back down. Now, uh, that's, <laughs> that, that's the day in which we live as well, is when the, the very tenets of the Baptist faith is being attacked and reattacked and attacked again. He, he says, Beloved, I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you or encourage you that you should earnestly contend for the faith. Now, he says, I had to encourage you to contend. Now, to contend is to fight or to defend. He said, when, when we should just be rejoicing in the goodness of God... They had to contend for the faith. You know what? The faith is being compromised today. It's being compromised greatly. Uh, you think about people, how many display love today? Now, I, I don't see that a lot among God's people. Do you? And, and, and shame on us. And so he had to go back to some principles, and we'll find the reason he had to relay the principles was very simple. If someone crept, crept in unawares. Now, there's nothing the devil enjoys more than this, is to splitting a church wide open. He, did, he, lo he loves to divide and conquer. And he does it... <laughs> By people we let creep in. Mm -hmm. And we have to be very careful of that. We have to be very cautious because we'll see that that's exactly what happened to this church that Jude was, was, was writing to is he had some people come in. Then he says in verse 4, for there are certain or specific men crept in unawares. Now, when someone creeps in unawares, that's the duty of the whole church. Not just me. I can be swayed. You can be swayed. Anybody? Uh, because we're made up of a carnal nature, any of us can be a hoodwinked. But these people came in unawares, and they messed up the church, What I was trying to mess up the church that Jude was, was apparently pastor of or writing to. And... He says they kept crept in unawares. You know, I, I want New Testament to grow, don't you? Yeah. But I want it to grow God's way. I don't. I don't want anybody creep in unawares that we uh, <laughs> that you may be regretful later. And if it could happen to the church in New Testament days, it can happen today easily. Um, and, and so we find that this was this was Jude's concern was that this church had some of these individuals in it. For there are certain men crept in unawares, and notice, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Now, this is the part of election that we don't necessarily turn cartwheels over. But I want you to see if they were ordained to that, to be a hindrance, to be a difficulty, to be a hardship to the church, there was no getting out of it. 
That's the reprobation. That's the flip side of divine election and, and glory to His name is knowing that there are people out there that will never, ever see you, no matter what you do. And the reality of this text, they get in the church. They, and, and it's a very deliberate action on their part. It, it's, not, uh, it, it's not just uh, per happenstance that it's very deliberate. And so if God ordains something, and my understanding of this text is that he does, you're going to have some of these show up. You're going to have some of these individuals around during, during some time or the other. Ungodly men. Now, I don't believe these will be men <laughs> running after women and, and, and drinking up and and, and, and boozing it out and all the obvious things we think. But ungodly men are this. They do not follow the word of God. And they are ungodly. You compare what they do to that book. And if it doesn't line up, you know what? They're ungodly men. That's very simple to understand, is it not? It's not complex. It's not like the Lord uh, give us some kind of crazy formula. They are ungodly men because they don't follow the word of God. Now notice, notice how their, their earmark is. Turning the grace of our Lord into lasciviousness. Now, this lasciviousness is lustful. Now, they, they make grace something lustful, something uh, to go after, to something to run toward. That is a lustful thing. If you lust after a woman, you, you run toward her. Now, in the modern day, grace is accepting Jesus Christ. Uh, gr uh, grace is drawing yourself near unto God. That's an impossibility with mankind. Uh, it, it isn't even a reality to be, to be heard. So what, what, what is all this new stuff out there today that's been accepted? Well, I'll go to Jesus when I want to. That's lustful. That's looking at Jesus like an ordinary person. That is lustful. That is prideful. And he says these are the individuals that kept crept in. They, they, they moved in on you. They, they slid in, and this is the result. And so we see one of these hallmarks is that they're going to be stuck on themselves. They're going to be prideful. They're going to uh, put more in this than they are in that. That, that, that. That's their hallmark. That's their symbol. That's who they are. And then he says in the rest of that verse, and denying the only Lord God. Now, you know, at one time when I was a little boy, and it might have been just me because I grew up in Carlisle, but the only time you ever heard Jehovah is when the Russellites showed up at your house, the Jehovah's Witnesses. You didn't hear the word Jehovah God in your average Baptist church. You, you didn't hear the, uh, the, the speechless name of Jesus in the average Baptist church. You didn't hear, I am who I, I am. Tell them I am sent you. Yeah. You did not hear that. No. And the reason why is because it had been turned into life citizens. You know what? Jehovah Jireh don't belong to the Russellites. It belongs to us. Mm -hmm. And... and and that was about forgotten. And so these individuals that he foretells of, he says, they're going to deny who Jehovah, who the Father is. Then notice what else they'll deny. Denying the only Lord God. Yeah. And our Lord Jesus Christ. Now how do you deny Jesus Christ? You know, we live in America... And, and even despite all the filth that's out there, there's very few individuals that's never heard the name of Jesus, right? But what have they turned him into? Somebody that's going to try to save you? Somebody that saves you and now you've got to do the rest? No. That's denying who he is, is it not? Yeah. 
And so Jude saw this and he was like, no, no, he's sovereign. He does what seemeth good unto himself. He, he, he is the maker. You're not. You're the created and, he, and he's the creator. And he had to remind the church of these things concerning the attributes of the Almighty. Verse 5. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord saved the people out of the land of Egypt, after, afterwards destroyed them that believed not. Now, he reminds them, just because you're delivered physically doesn't mean you're redeemed. He delivered four and a half million people out of Egypt into, into uh, the new kingdom, into, into Israel. But what had to happen first after they crossed that river Jordan and they were built against God, an entire generation had to die. Mm -hmm. and, and you know why? There's, there are these jannies and jamborees that are still out there today. And, uh, and, and it had to be dealt with. In other words, just because they had physical deliverance doesn't mean that they were spiritually born again. And, and, and we need to look at that closely in the modern day and see what we attribute, attribute to God that, that, that it really belongs to God. And he said, so just because they say they're saved does not mean they are. Watch them. Look at it. Evaluate. Look what's going on. Verse 6. And the angels, going back all the way back before what we knew maybe in the Garden of Eden I guess there had to be an earth to be cast to the earth right somewhere in that period and the angels which kept not their first estate but left their own habitation where they lived where they abode with God he had reserved in everlasting chains under darkness into the judgment of that great day. Now, we're going to talk about how that applies in, in a couple of different ways, but let me say this, first of all, that the angels that rebelled against God are not currently bound in the fact that they can't do nothing. Because we'll find, we'll find individuals like Legion where they were wreaking havoc in lives. But that chain... <laughs> It's as good as they're already in the, under the full wrath right. of God. Yeah. That's the chain. <clears throat> that, that, that's, that's what they cannot and will not get out of. They're condemned already. And, and so we see that sometimes there's some, you know what? Uh, <laughs> there's chains in every one of our lives of some type of addiction. Since I've been working home health again, I've noticed my diet Dr. Pepper has gone up exponentially. You see what I'm saying? I've tried it. It's just like my mother-in-law and her coffee. I just can't quit it. And I just have to be honest about it. You see what I'm saying? Uh, going to try to do better about it, but it's just how it is. That is the change. Mankind cannot get away from chains, but grace can get you away from chains. It's not in the ability of mankind to do it. And so we all have these things in our life, but this is the condemnation, the destiny of these angels. They're chained to it. It's how it's going to be. <laughs> Look with me in uh, Revelation, just a little, a little further over. Revelation chapter 12, very familiar verse of Scripture, but I want to point it out to you. Revelation chapter 12 and uh, verse 9, and again, I'm assuming there had to be an earth for this to occur. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9, and the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. Now, if you underline in the Bible, underline the world, because that means, it doesn't mean the earth, the planet earth, it means the created with it. Uh, he deceived the whole world. You know why people believe stuff like baptismal regeneration and cannot get away from it? It's because they're deceived. They believe it as much as you and I believe grace. 
And it's one of those chains, right? It, it's one of those things that they can't willfully get away from unless Christ intervenes. He was cast into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So they're here, they're chained to their destiny, and they're wreaking havoc until that day arrives. They're doing all they can do, all they, all they can do is follow Lucifer, Lucifer's commands, and they're doing exactly what he says to do, and they're doing it, Johnny, on the spot. Now, look with me in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5. Uh, Mark, chapter 5. And uh, we'll, we'll begin reading in the first verse and to see how far we want to go with that. Mark, chapter 5, in the first verse, the Bible says, And they came over unto the uh, other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadareans. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. Now, I will, and we'll get to this in a minute, uh, maybe after the Gadara, and we'll find out how many devils that he had. But I want you to note that it says he had a unclean spirit. Now, devils within the individual will make you come across as mean as a junkyard dog, just a foul spirit about you the minute you walk in the room. That's what they were seeing in Legion. It wasn't seeing all the devils. All right. It was seeing how they presented. Uh, we, we need to be aware of that within uh, people that we come, uh, come across along the way is it, the reality that this entails. And so, uh, he, he had a foul spirit. He presented poorly. Verse 3. Who had his dwelling, or where he lived, who had his dwelling among the tombs, which was a hateful, gross thing in the Jewish culture, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Now, physically with chains, he could not be bound because he was bound by another. Because he, because he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. Now let me just pause there for a minute, and, and I, I don't even know if it's still a thing now, but when at Adam's generation were teenagers, there's all this cutting yourself, cutting, cut, you know, they cut and, and bleed out on things, and I knew, I knew young people that were actually involved in it. You know what? That's not a new deception of the devil. It's been around a long time. So you, 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 can, you can check it out here, and when you see that thing, you just, uh, you, you can write her off to depression if you want to, but I want you to see the origin tonight that that's always been around. Self-destruction is part of the lost game. And there's, there's no choice in it. Verse 6. But when he, meaning this maniac of Gadara, and when he saw Jesus afar off, notice this, he ran and worshipped him. You know what the Bible says? Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Jesus Christ the Lord. Yeah. So this, this young boy had no, no choice. He, you know what, what a wonderful thing. He ran up there to worship him. You ever seen any people running in the building here? There's no choice. He will get glory. Isn't that a wonderful thing tonight? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I always say this, but I cannot get my mind off the fact. Uh, <laughs> can you imagine the, those individuals which crammed Roe v. Wade down our throats in 73, bowing down and said, you're right, Lord God. You were right all along. It's coming. If you believe the book, you have to believe that that's part of the glorifying of the Lord God Almighty is when He is glorified by individuals like this. Verse 7, And cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son 
of the Most High God, I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. Now what a praiseworthy statement of a man fully possessed of devils that, no, notice what he says. <laughs> He, he said, what I have to do with you, he knew he was contrary to him. He knew he was a lost person and had no, and had no business at the feet of Jesus. What do I have to do with you? Huh. And he recognized his uh, position, thou son of the most high God. He knew that he was Jesus. He knew he was the God man. He knew he was the son of God. He recognized, he knew who he was and give him glory for it. Then he says, I adjure thee by God torment me not. He knew he could do it, didn't he? <laughs> Be a wonderful thing. That's a, that's a revealed truth that people could see that today. Verse 8, For he, meaning Christ, said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he, meaning Christ, asked him, meaning the maniac, What is thy name? And he answered and says, My name is Legion. For we are many. Yeah. Now, so now we get from that foul presentation to the fact that there were thousands of devils in this one person. And, and, and you know the rest. They said, well, let us go into them hogs. And he said, go on. The hogs couldn't handle them. Throw them and drown the hogs. You know, have you ever thought that what a constitution that shows that, that humankind has? that 2,000 hogs couldn't hold them, but one man was. That's a pretty scary thought, ain't it? Mm -hmm. You wonder how people do things today? That's how. How multiple children are murdered by the same individual? That's how. How, how people don't blink an eye at, at you know, uh, Charles Manson, <laughs> um, Ted Bundy. How did they do that? That's how. That's how they did it. That's right. and, and, and so we find, as the Lord's people, that, that uh, it is a marvel to me that a mankind can handle that, but I know that it can. Remember Mary Magdalene? How she's introduced. Mary Magdalene, Magdalene of whom was cast out seven devils. She could house up seven. And so we, we know these individuals, <laughs> these devils are, they're going to fulfill their purpose. Right. They're condemned already on their way. And, and you know, that should, that should humble us to seek after God, should it not? Yeah. And, and for those of us that are redeemed, it should make us glorify him more and more and more. Because were it not for the grace of God, we would be in the exact same situation. And, and that ought to cause us to give glory and honor to him just because he spared us because of his goodness and grace and mercy that we don't have to, that we don't have to go that route. Now, last place and this one for the redeemed. I'm not going to read it all in the book of Acts, chapter uh, 12. Y'all all know it anyway, but I just want to uh, i just want to make a couple of notes for you. Where God's people are to be at. Acts, chapter 12, uh, verse 7. Acts, chapter 12, and verse 7. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, meaning Peter, and a light shone, shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up and saying, Arise quickly, and his chains fell off from his hands. Now these are literally chains, literal fetters, but they were a hindrance unto Peter, were they not? Peter was scheduled for execution the next morning. Uh, they'd already gotten chains, and Peter was next. And he was chained to a situation, but God delivered him. Man. Now, you may find yourself in a pretty rough situation, but if you belong to God, and he still has a plan for your life, there's deliverance. Now, I want, to, I want you to see 
Another thing in this, so God gets the glory, Peter never asked for it. In fact, he was very comfortable with death, and he was chained with a guard on each side and sleeping. <laughs> Yeah. Lord, deliver me! No, no, no. <laughs> now, there was a church party down there doing it for him, but he wasn't. Right. And, and, and <laughs> God honored the prayers of the saints, did he not? <laughs> and I uh, can't remember, was it? I can't remember the girl. She thought, <laughs> she thought it was a ghost, remember? He got, he got back down there where the church was meeting, and it, he knocked on the door and said, oh, it's his spirit. No, God had done a great thing and got man, that man out of chains. We, um, we need not ever um, forget the power of God. Um, it would be a, it would, it's a very much a fearful thing uh, to be chained up. But what a glorious thing it is when God comes to deliver you. Uh, I fully believe this. Uh, you'll live as long as God's got service for you. Yeah. And then you'll go home. Pretty much how it is, is it not? Yeah.